a program from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, ICSA, is now at your doorstep. By the way, what is corporate governance and what are its key pillars? Would there be any conflict of interest if a person combines the roles of a chairman and a chief executive officer in a corporate organization? What can Nigeria do to get international recognition in the context of the application of corporate governance? These are many more questions that will be answered on Corporate Governance Platform, a program designed to inform and educate our numerous viewers on the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Join the Corporate Governance Platform Cool every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. on MITV, your talent station via DSTV 255 and UHF 43. Corporate Governance Platform, your strategy for the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, except the heart of governance professionals. Thanks for joining us on Corporate Governance Platform, proudly brought to you by the Institute of Shuttle Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria. I am Tundi Odeyemi, your handcomer, and in today's episode, we are going to take a look at the relevance of whistleblowing to corporate sustainability. And I have with me right here in the studio, Ms. Bolanle Awe, she's going to lead in the conversation. And Ms. Bolanle Awe is, is the CEO of NGS Regulation, which is a subsidiary of the Nigerian Exchange Group PRC. She is a trustee of the Nigerian Exchange Limited Investors Protection Fund, member of the Board of Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, and a non-executive director of the Central Securities Clearing System PRC. She has LLB degree from the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ilefe, as well as LLM degrees from Harvard Law School and the London School of Economics and Political Science. She is admitted to both the Nigerian and New York bars. She is an associate member of the Nigerian Institute of Shuttle Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria and Institute of Capital Market Registrars. Ms. Awe is a life member of the Institute of Directors and was a member of the Senate's Technical Advisory Committee on the Companies and Allied Matters Act Amendment Bill of 2020. She is a recipient of the African Legal Awards 2018 General Council of the Year 2017-2018, Lord Digest African Awards. She was recently selected as one of the World Federation of Exchange Women Leaders for 2021. And her interests include education, traveling, African art, gender, and development. Ms. Awe, you're welcome to Corporate Governance Platform. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you. We are discussing um, the relevance of whistleblowing to corporate sustainability. And I'd like us to start this conversa conversation by you telling us what is whistleblowing and, of course, what is the purpose of whistleblowing. Okay. So whistleblowing is basically a framework that an organization has in order to have internal and external stakeholders to the organization inform the organization about wrongdoing in the organization. The wrongdoing can be financial wrongdoing, it can be corruption, it can be breaches of policies and procedures of the organization, anything that is negative to the interest of the organization. The purpose is clear, and the purpose is that if there are things that are wrong, then an organization should get to know about it so that it can take measures to halt and then to uh, remediate. Okay, then what is the relevance of uh, whistleblowing to the concept of corporate governance? Okay. I think if we look at what corporate governance is supposed to be at its simplest form, corporate governance is about the relationships that are in organizations, how, those, how an organization runs so that it runs properly in a well-governed manner. And so um, if, you, if you look at um, corporate governance from that perspective, and then you look at what we've said about whistleblowing, Blowing. which is that it is to bring light on negative practices so that the organization can take action uh, to deal with these practices, you can see how they combine together. One is about making an organization run properly. And so one of the pillars of getting an organization to run properly is to have an appropriate whistleblowing framework so that you can take out those negative things and have the organization stand and run well. And you know, in the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance, there's actually a principle, principle 19, that specifically deals with whistleblowing. 
So what you're saying in essence, in a sound corporate governance principles requires whistleblowing. Indeed. Indeed, okay. The Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance provides that the framework for whistleblowing should be known to employees and external stakeholders. So what's the best way companies can do this? I think the best way that companies can do it is, first of all, to engage in education about it. So um, in order to get people to be willing to come forward, you have to tell them what you have. So it's not something that you build a whistleblowing program and then you hide it under a bushel. Okay. You need to let people know about it. You need to educate people as to how they can interact with your program, what they can do. And I think one of the ways that that can be very well done is using technology. A lot of companies are looking at having portals, whistleblowing portals, where people can actually um, put um, information that they want to blow the whistle on in those portals. So they have that portal, it's open to everybody? Indeed. Okay. Yes. Now, do you think it's better for the information received from a whistleblower, you know, to be investigated by an external person instead of using a person within the organization in order to ensure objectivity and protect the, you know, the reputation of the organization? Okay. So I think that uh, it really depends. So there's no one size fits all. Okay. I personally, because of independence and objectivity and because of trust in the whistleblowing system, I like the idea of having an outsourced, a third party in, the, uh, you know, in charge of the whistleblowing framework. But that's expensive. And you know, companies want to be in business to make money, sure. not to run whistleblowing frameworks. Exactly. So obviously, <laughs> um, you know, each company can decide based on its pocket. But the key thing, I think, is part of what some of the adjectives you used in your question. The objectivity. Trust, objectivity, independence, impartiality. Okay. Which system, whatever system you have, those things, reliability, accessibility, all of those um, factors you need to um, you know, have in mind when you decide whether you're using an internal or an external. using an external person to yes, do it. Okay. Yes. Now, there is no specific provision in the Code of Corporate Governance for the board to know about the findings or complaints received from the whistleblower. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think the board should know about this in order to take appropriate action? You know, everything revolves around the board as well. With corporate and there is no specific yes. provision in the, in, in, in the code that the board should know. How do you think okay, can so, go around this? Okay, so there are actually provisions in the code for oh, the sure. board to know. So okay. as I said, there is that principle 19 that actually deals with whistleblowing. And if you look at it, I think there are about seven or eight subsections in principle 19. About four of them say the board should, the board should, the board should. Okay. So clearly the board is front, center, and around uh, the, the whole issue of whistleblowing. whistleblowing. Now also there's another principle, principle 11, where we're discussing the committees that a well-governed company should have. Mm -hmm. One of those um, committees is the audit committee. And specifically there, one of the uh, obligations of the audit committee is to be the committee that receives reporting about how the whistleblowing framework is going. Who is reporting? What are the statistics? What are they reporting? You've investigated. What have you found? What remedial measures have you taken? Have you sanctioned anybody if you found that the, that the report that was made is a, a valid report? And all those things are to be funneled to the board through the audit committee of the board. So the board is very, very involved in it. And in a well-run company, the tone from the top regarding whistleblowing actually comes from the board. Let me ask, of all the committees, why the audit committee? Well, I think it's because the audit committee is the committee that actually has uh, the remit for things like investigation, okay. ensuring that internal control is appropriate, ensuring that all the policies that we put in place are being followed. And you remember, for a framework like whistleblowing, it will be underpinned by whistleblowing policy. policy so that makes, I think it makes sense. Okay. Now, how can an organization obtain additional information from the whistleblower? You know, when the code says the information can be provided anonymously, and there is no contact details to follow up by the organization. Okay, so in that type of situation, um, you know, it's it's a, it's basically a balancing act. So the code, I think, is concerned with the fact that if we don't have protection for whistleblowers, then the people that actually provide the substance for the whistleblowing framework to work, 
will not provide that um, substance. And so the code says, have a guarantee of anonymity. It doesn't mean that if you, as a whistleblower, want to know, have been known, you can't be known. So if you look at um, a number of whistleblowing portals, such as, for example, the one of the Nigerian Stock Exchange or the one of the Federal Ministry of Finance, you will find that the, um, what the, you have sections for people to say their names, but those are not necessary sections that have to be filled. So it's up to a whistleblower to say, I will let myself be known if it wants to be known. Now, if he or she wants to be known. Now, a whistleblower that um, acts under the cover of, look, it says I can, uh, you should guarantee my anonymity. How do we get back to the person if we want clarification? How do we get back to the person if we want further information? Mm -hmm. Now, if you use technology, for example, you, and you have a whistleblowing protocol, you can have mm -hmm. a number that is assigned to the report, and then you, know, you use the number to track to the person. You can also have um, various other ways of getting to know. Apart from that, even within the information that has been disclosed, it's not always necessary that you go back to the whistleblower. So if somebody says a procurement system in company B is, uh, you know, the procurement manager is corrupt, you can ask other people about that information. You may not necessarily have to go back to the anonymous whistleblower. Yes, to the anonymous whistleblower. So the whistleblower, in a way, provides the opportunity to do further investigation and get further details from other people. In a properly investigated whistleblower, if you make a proper investigation of the whistleblowing report, you don't necessarily have to go back to the whistleblower. It may be good if you want clarification, maybe they, they, they wrote something and you don't understand their writing, All that right. kind of thing. But clearly, um, these things always have other names. Okay, um, let me ask this explore. question. That, that, that is taken. Mm -hmm. Now, is it necessary for the organizations to give an update to the whistleblower on the steps that's taken on the information provided? If yes, what is the procedure to be adopted? Okay, so I wouldn't say that it is necessary. Okay. So I think it is good practice for you to give an, uh, you, for you to give some reporting. Now, when I say reporting, I don't mean the type of reporting that you will give your audit committee. Okay. It can be a report where, for example, if we use the whistleblowing portal again, somebody can come. I punch in my my secret code that the the, the system gave me when I did the when I made the report about whistleblowing, and I go in there and I can see a one liner that says investigation ongoing i can say another line one line investigation completed recommendations being you know that kind of thing also depending on how important it the matter is for the company it might actually be in the company's own interest, interest. to actually come out and say we got a, 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 a whistle about x and y we are a well-run company so we've done one two three four five things and announce it and it gives the impression that that is a well-run company because you found a, a negative thing you dealt you, you 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 didn't you didn't shy from investigating it you found who the culprits were you you sanctioned them and then you you, you made um, you took remedial steps so really in, in in collaboration with their communication people i think a company can decide what it wants to do with the whistleblowing uh, with the reports of what happened. Okay, it shows that the company has nothing to hide. Indeed, it does. Okay, at this point, I'd like, to, I'd like us to go for a very short break. When we come back, we continue the conversation with Ms. Awe. Please don't go away. Corporate Governance Platform, a program from the Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, ICSA, is now at your doorstep. By the way, what is Corporate Governance and what are its key pillars? Would there be any conflict of interest if a person combines the roles of a chairman and a chief executive officer in a corporate organization? What can Nigeria do to gain international recognition in the context of the application of corporate governance? These are many more questions will be answered on Corporate Governance Platform, a program designed to inform and educate our numerous viewers on the adoption of corporate governance best practices by corporate entities. Join the Corporate Governance Platform Cool every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. on MITV, your talent station via DSTV 255 and UHF 43. Corporate Governance Platform, your strategy for the adoption of corporate governance 
best practices by corporate entities. Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, Ixem, the heart of governance professionals. You are welcome back and thanks for joining us on Corporate Governance Platform, proudly brought to you by the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria. Uh, we are having a conversation on the relevance of whistleblowing and corporate sustainability. And leading in that discussion is Ms. Tinoade Awe, the CEO NGX Regulation. Yeah, Ms. Awe, you talked about the importance of having a whistleblowing policies, whistleblowing framework in an organization. I'd like to bring a scenario to you now. When a whistleblower alleges that he's being victimized, and presents a complaint to both the board and, of course, the regulator of the organization. But they both have conflicting positions on the allegation. What should the whistleblower do to get justice? Or is there another available options for the whistleblower? Okay. So a whistleblower that alleges that they've been victimized has actually changed positions slightly from being a whistleblower to being a complainant because they are now saying, I've blown a whistle and then retaliatory or detrimental, uh, uh, I've, I've suffered a detriment. Oh, there's difference between the two. Yes, there's difference between the two, but need not detain us. Okay. But I'm just trying to say, so if in that kind of situation, a whistleblower is not without remedy, what the whistleblower can do is to escalate through the complaint process of the regulator. I have gone to, I've, I've, I've engaged with this, uh, with the whistleblowing process. I have suffered a detriment, and therefore regulator, um, the board of this company, doesn't agree that I've suffered a, a, a detriment. Detriments. Regulator, I would like you to look at it. Okay. And in the hierarchy of decision making between a company, a company's board, and its regulator, the regulator is clearly um, of a of a higher hierarchy. Right. Now, if you look at the corporate governance code, the corporate governance code actually says that um, in principle 19 again, I think it's one of the last sections, talks about how um, where there is a detriment that is suffered. Then, you can have a reinstatement if, for example, somebody loses their job, or you can have compensation. So it clearly um, anticipates that there might be detriment suffered and gives some um, comfort for a board to act or for the regulator to act. Also, many regulators, so I'm familiar with the capital market, I can tell you that the apex regulator of the Nigerian capital market takes um, whistleblowing and actually providing information about things that are going wrong very seriously mm. and in, under the SEC rules there is ability for the SEC to act in those types of situations uh, where it feels that the board of the regulated entity or indeed the entire regulated entity is not behaving appropriately with respect to providing protection for people who actually talk about wrongdoing. Okay well, my takeaway from this is that you don't have to go to the board and the regulator at the same time. Maybe you go to the board, so whatever outcome from the board, you now go to the regulator. Yes. Oh. It, it, it's called, um, basically, it, it's just good practice. Let the board, which is the highest governance body of an organization, deal with the issue. And in a, in a proper, uh, a good whistleblowing framework and policy, that form of escalation will be one of the things that is in the framework that allows the board to actually uh, you know, act in those types of situations. Okay, let's look at this issue. How would you recon reconcile the practice that whistleblowing can be done you know, anonymously and the recent initiative to give whistleblower incentives can be done anon anonymously, then there is also incentives for okay. so, the whistleblower. Um, I think you are talking about the Federal Ministry of Finance whistleblowing, uh, you know, the national whistleblowing policy in that situation. Now, um, I actually recently had a look at that, uh, that portal. Is it is only Federal Ministry of Finance that have that incentives? The Fed is, the, is the one I'm aware of okay. that is actually publicly known. Okay. It's quite possible that, public, that companies also have similar incentives for their internal stakeholders or external stakeholders. But I think the one, if we focus just on, to use an example. Okay. So if you go to that portal, you will see that you, there are certain um, questions that are asterisked. The asterisk questions do not include name, detail, and contact details. So it means that you can submit your um, your your report of whistleblowing anonymously on that federal government, federal ministry of finance portal. And I think what that what you can do is again using technology, 
if you submit an anonymous uh, uh, report, um, if to claim your um, compensation, if you meet the standards for claiming compensation, yes, then obviously you have all sorts of things. You have the automated code that is generated when you submit the report. So the federal government can simply announce X, Y, uh, we've done this, so we're looking for somebody, and you provide the code. Or what we sometimes have in forms that we feel, which is tell us a secret question, and that only you have the answer to where was your father born? Where, what, where did your parents meet you? That kind of thing. So there are ways of dealing with these things, in my opinion. So the whistleblower in a way can be identified? Yes, yes. Can be identified for the purposes of compensation. But it doesn't stop the whistle, the, the process of investigating the reports and all of that. At the point of compensation, if we then need to get in touch with the whistleblower and use that the use of technology, these are examples of the way that you can get the correct person. Okay. Now, is whistleblowing as a principle mm -hmm. only relevant to public limited companies, federal government agencies, big companies as it were? What of small and medium enterprise? It's relevant to everybody. Remember that what we said with whistleblowing is, is when um, you have a framework that allows people, either internal stakeholders such as your employees or external stakeholders such as your suppliers, okay. to tell you about wrongdoing within the company, if we, if we define whistleblowing as that. So it can happen in any company, even in a mom and pop shop. It's, it's possible that there's somebody there who is taking flour, uh, you know, in a bakery, yeah. who is taking flour and diverting it somewhere, or inflating the price of margarine, and people get to know. So every whistleblower, whistleblowing is relevant to anywhere that there, there's human endeavor, and the possibility that uh, human greed or human, uh, you know, just wrongdoing, wrongdoing can occur. Now that takes me to another area. Okay. Can whistleblowing be done without a whistleblowing framework or whistleblowing <laughs> policy? Okay. <laughs> so whistleblowing can be done um, without a whistleblowing framework. Okay. Because uh, it's, it, you, I mean, we've all been young. You go and you, you're, you have older siblings and maybe one of them is taking daddy's car, car out. You whistleblow to daddy and say, I don't want daddy to know that it was me. So it can be done without a framework. Is that ideal? No. We're talking about companies being properly okay. run. And when you have the framework, things like board escalation, escalation mm. to the regulator, things that, you know, you go end to end and it gives a level of confidence and, uh, in the system and trust and reliability. Unlike if, you know, I blow a whistle, there's no framework. I don't know whether I can be retaliated against. Mm. I don't know what will happen to the whistle. You know, it just doesn't engender um, the kind of behavior that we are trying to engender when we have a policy. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, what advice do you have for organizations on whistleblowing? The advice I have for organizations is that it's something that they should take very seriously around corporate sustainability. Okay. We all want to be sustainable. We all want to have sustainable organizations. So every company, I think, that wants to project itself as well governed should have a whistleblowing framework. And technology, I think, has made it much easier for um, those kinds of um, initiatives to be brought uh, to bear uh, on, on the corporate world. So I think it's, it's a no-brainer. It's something that every well-known company should have. And also, f if you are trying to attract investors who are interested in investing in ethical companies, one of the things that they will be looking at is to ensure that you have a mechanism for dealing with negative occurrences. And one trying tested mechanism is having a whistleblowing framework that works. From your experience, would you say whistleblowing has indeed assisted some organizations from moving away from wrongdoings to rightdoings? I certainly think so. I think that, um, you know, in my experience, you have organizations um, that have had um, some challenges with um, whether it's fraud or corruption or just all sorts of negative activity within the company. And when they've had a whistleblowing framework, somebody's come, told them something, they've been able to attack based on that framework, follow the whistle 
get to the root of things, remove that type of activity and move on. And sometimes it can really affect the bottom line. In the example I gave about somebody diverting flour or another person diverting mandarin, it can really affect the profit and the income of that company. And obviously in the end, government tax and also, so it has a, 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 a real effect, multiplier effect in the economy. So, you know, I think uh, the answer to your question, my long-winded answer to your question is yes. <laughs> and this is going to be your final, the final <laughs> question before we wrap it up. Okay. What are your final words to organizations concerning whistleblowing? Okay. Uh, final word, whistleblowing is uh, a, a characteristic of well-run organizations. Okay. Uh, it's something that can lead to sustainability. There is a case for it. There is a case for it, an economic case for whistleblowing as well. And it's something that organizations should take very seriously. And um, the technology makes it easier to do. That's my final word. Thank you very much, Ms. Tinu Adia. We're CEO NGS Regulations for sharing your thoughts with us on the relevance of whistleblowing to corporate sustainability. This is where we draw the curtain and wrap it up for this episode. Thanks for joining us on the program. Please do join us again next week, same time, same station. I remain Tundi Odeyemi. Thank you. Corporate Governance Platform, a program from the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, ICSA, is now at your doorstep. By the way, what is corporate governance and what are its key pillars? Would there be any conflict of interest if a person combines the roles of a chairman and a chief executive chief officer in a corporate organization? What can Nigeria do to gain international recognition in the context of the application of corporate governance? These are many more questions that will be answered on Corporate Governance Platform, a program designed to inform and educate our numerous viewers on the adoption of corporate